Uh, where where are we starting? So this is this is my first time doing this, uh, Joseph. So what happens? It's our brand new kind of revisiting documentaries, kind of at random, but also because they kind of bring up interesting themes for us to do a bit of a deep dive into. That's kind of the elevator pitch. Sounds good. So the Last... late call up this week is uh, Katie, the 2018 Katie Taylor documentary. Uh, which just came to mind to me the other night after kind of the fallout of the fight and kind of soaking it all up and taking in all the reaction. Um, it's actually, it's only, it's amazing that it's only from 2018, considering how much has happened since then. But um, just kind of, there's a few, few points I want to get to. I might just start off by setting the way the documentary itself sets itself up by just playing a kind of the opening sequence here, which is Eddie Hearn speaking about his first interaction with Katie Taylor. at midnight, the 4th of October, 2016. She actually sent me a direct message on Twitter. Hi, Eddie. I hope you don't mind me reaching out like this out of the blue. I've been seriously considering turning pro the last few months. I think I could do for women's pro boxing what I did for the amateur sport. Of course, the pro game is impossible without a great promoter. Hi, Katie. I've never been involved with women's boxing, but let's talk. from the amateur game, someone who's achieved that much always deserves the time to at least hear her side out. I've never met anyone so driven, forget boxing, in life. You know, it got moving very quickly. You know, what's gone on with her life, it's not something really I've talked about. You know, it's personal. It's been a, a tough few months. I needed a change and ultimately I do want to bring women's boxing to a new level. Do I know Katie? Probably not. I don't think many people really know Katie Taylor. Right, so that's the opening sequence to the documentary, Katie. It's available for one ninety nine on Amazon. Uh, YouTube and Sky have it as well. It's paywall there, obviously. So um, if you're a subscriber, you can get it. And um, we figured this was a good thing to look back on this week. Um, Ross Whitaker made that. Um, you know, you'll be familiar with Ross from some of the other great Irish sports documentaries over the last decade or so. He made a brilliant one about surfing, which uh, you should... Um, about particularly surfing aliens down in Clare. And I guess uh, interesting that I, I wonder would he say the same thing now, mm. Eddie Hearn, that he doesn't know her? Has she become less guarded as that period of her life has receded? Well, I, pre- I presume, and like uh, uh, Joe, like I mean, you've you just rewatched it. Like I haven't, I've only, I only saw it when it came out. Like the, the whole point of the the documentary, from my perspective anyway, and the thing I learned the most was the seclusion that that Katie had. I guess opted for in terms of her training in Connecticut, and as far as I'm aware, that hasn't changed over the last little while. So, her... do you feel though that like she's become less guarded? You know that the the there's more of. I mean, we still don't know that much about her her personal life, and just recently in the press conferences or in the interviews, she was talking about um, people don't ask the male boxers the same questions, and it's true they don't. You know. Yeah. Um, so do you feel like you know more about Katie Taylor now than you did? No, I don't think I do. I, I'm not sure, Joe, what do you think? But like, I, I think that that seclusion, as I mentioned, I think kind of create, like, uh, like helps kind of create that. We'll get him back in a sec. Yeah. Um, and I think from Eddie Hearn's perspective, that might be the same thing. I'm sure over the last couple of weeks, he feels that he knows Katie Taylor a bit better now than he has done at any other point because there was a massive push behind this. You're, you're in New York together. You're probably spending a bit of time together. But I, I suspect that he's relatively hands-off in, in that regard and it's just, you know, the, the public dealings that, that he has with each other. they got a very professional relationship. And I'd say that's the way she keeps it with, with everybody. I'd say um, her coach, Ross, is probably one of the people that knows her best and I think you kind of got that feeling from the documentary as well. Yeah, Joseph's back. Joseph? We were just Morning saying again. We were just saying we don't really know Katie Taylor. Um, um, Eddie Hearn had said there at the end of that clip that you know none of us do, and I was making the point that we probably still would feel as a public the same. Yeah, it's really interesting. I wonder as well, kind of like how much do we want to know Katie Taylor? Um, it's kind of it's uh, we have like another quick clip here, which is Ross uh, Whitaker actually speaking to Owen when the documentary came out, and um, 
I think it's interesting for a couple of minutes. We might play it quickly and I might just come back to a couple of the things that he says. This is a bit of a super cut of his chat with Owen back in 2018. Katie is a fascinating character without necessarily being a colourful character. Mm. You know, and she's incredibly quietly charismatic, which is one of the first things I realised when I got to spend the first little bits of time with her. Is like she's so charismatic and without saying anything. Katie had kind of always been interested or had for some time been interested in a documentary because I think possibly, you know, she feels like her story should be documented in some shape or form. And it just had never worked out. Um, and my approach to things, I suppose, is quite fly in the wall or I sort of call it witnessing. You know, you want to witness the story as it happens. And we kind of felt that that would work better for her, you know, to just kind of be there um, to kind of gauge for her as more of an introverted person when was enough, you know, when okay. when to push it and when not to push it. Um, she just bought into it. And thank, I'm, I'm delighted she did. I think this film's kind of important, you know, it's important to have been able to document someone as as uh, noteworthy as Katie is and as, who's kind of a legend of sport. Um, and to be able to kind of have that document there into the future, because I think it'll be something that people will look back upon when they think of Katie Taylor in the future. And she said to me to start, I want it to be the truth. I want it to be raw if it has to be raw. If we're going to do it, let's do it properly. And we could agree on that, obviously. Yeah, and uh, look, I, I guess that's the whole point, that it is something that you look back on this week in the aftermath of her um, beating Amanda Serrano in Madison Square Garden. Yeah, exactly. And kind of, he's talking about this being potentially an important thing to document and kind of, I like as well the way he kind of phrases, use that phrase, bearing witness, the idea of kind of, being the fly in the wall, watching this amazing story unfold. Um, back in 2018, there is kind of, he's talking about sort of, and I think part of what they're using that Eddie Hearn clip there to allude to about getting to know Katie is like this all kind of came a bit against the backdrop of Rio and against the backdrop of the breakdown of relationship with her father, who used to be her coach, um, and kind of uh, her parents separating. So that's kind of, in the background of the film, even watching it now, kind of on a week like this, going back to it, it's really interesting how much kind of Rio is this kind of big narrative in it. And that's, it's a big narrative and kind of at that time was like, these are big questions that need to be answered. And obviously she's kind of taking part in this project where we're getting these insights that we don't typically get from her, especially kind of given her personality and given that she's not sort of this kind of big like uh, presence who's kind of always coming out addressing things or in the media. but um, why I think it's good to go back to it this week is kind of how quickly all that's kind of moved on and almost the goalposts have changed. Uh, this piece goes from her kind of turning pro, like we've kind of seen there, and sort of up to her first world title, which even, I think kind of what's most interesting is kind of seeing the lows of her rise, because it's kind of like you've got this kind of rocky sort of going up through the ranks in these different arenas. Uh, she has kind of this peak where she's on one of the AJ undercards. They're doing a real good job building her up. They're like, okay, we got to get you to the US, got to get you to the US. So she ends up in this card uh, in the Barclays Center kind of towards the end of 2017. And just on kind of what Ross said there about bearing witness, I just want to play another clip I think is really interesting, kind of hits the nail on the head, in my opinion, of why this film is really interesting to go back to this week. This is her after she's won in her US debut fighting on an undercard, not even making the TV um, schedule. So this is kind of effectively a dark, uh, what you call like a dark match, whatever, and uh, not really seen, uh, very kind of underpowered opponent. Uh, this is the immediate reaction in the bowels of the Barclays Center. And just the end of the clip is kind of a follow-up meeting with our manager, uh, Brian Peters, afterwards. But um, yes, have a listen to this. We're all just a little bit, I suppose, disappointed. You obviously would like to have a little more opposition just to, to keep advancing. Like, all, they're all bitching. They don't get a break. They're not getting fights. They're not getting treated equal because they're not f***ing fighting. The girls are always saying they're not getting the opportunities, and when the opportunities do, do come along, they should be jumping at those opportunities. It seems like with the women, there's a huge gap. It's like you've got lower level, and then all of a sudden, it's like they're up here. There's not much middle ground. Have bigger challenges to get ready for the title fights. They get higher up the card, yeah. and obviously they get on the main TV, yeah. the mainstream TV, but the opponent has to be good for that, which the last one wasn't. You were nearly willing to fight for free to get a proper opponent, which people yeah. wouldn't understand. Do you know, do you remember saying that? I no? do, I do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a surprise, I got a check after the fight. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Uh, from there to selling out 
MSG. It's quite the journey. Exactly. And that's only the middle of 2017. You've got the pandemic shutdown in between now and then. But um, where the film leaves us off as well, it's like before the two pursuit fights and that fight last week, which are really like putting everything else aside. That's what I mean about looking at kind of even the focus that people looked at Katie in 2018 as this sort of, there's a bit of a shadow um, in the wake of kind of the failure to get the second Olympic gold uh, to kind of where we are now. All that kind of real just kind of seems like a footnote and a bit of a kind of process she had to go to to get to where she was actually going rather than this sort of, obviously at the time I'm sure now, she, she still speaks about kind of um, kind of still being affected by that. But obviously as time goes on, as she keeps achieving these amazing things, that's just kind of going further and further into the background and kind of uh, a less important part of the story. Um, and just one other kind of aspect of it that I thought was really interesting, again, kind of looking at the frame of kind of going back after the weekend was we kind of, we get nuggets like she does kind of, she addresses her family situation in the film and kind of speaks about sort of obviously it being a tragedy from her perspective, but kind of that she's on good terms with both parents. Um, and she kind of speaks a bit about sort of her personality, like she's living in uh, rural Connecticut. She seems to be happy kind of, off the beaten track, she talks about how sort of there's these like real nice shots. I say it took a lot of time to probably get. Um, where it's just her in the kitchen, kind of saying, "Oh, I meet a few people at church at the weekend. Uh, maybe I should start trying to make friends." And it kind of leaves it there. They're kind of like the little nuggets you're getting into, kind of that kind of the Eddie Hearn sort of do we get to know Katie? But uh, one thing that I think is really interesting in the idea of kind of this being an important piece that's kind of there as a fly on the wall and a bit of a kind of dead presence just taking things in uh, there's this clip of kind of this ritual that she does uh, kind of a pre-fight prayer with her family with her mother uh, leading the prayer so again can have a quick listen to this and uh, we might talk about it afterwards Lord, I pray now for Katie tonight, Lord God, from this moment, Father God, before she even leaves this room, mm -hmm. that your angels, Lord God, will be summoned, Lord God, mm -hmm. that they will be posted around our Lord God. Mm -hmm. You will guard and protect her now in all our ways, Lord God. Mm -hmm. She has to win this world title fight because she's staked so much on it. If she loses this, she is on the trajectory of Rio. And Lord, I pray for supernatural strength for her. I pray for accuracy in our punch and Father God. Yes, I pray that she will rise up. That's Johnny Waterson's voice there in the middle of that as well, Joe. Yeah, and again, you can hear he's saying sort of, off. Oh, she doesn't deliver the world title, kind of, this is another potential Rio. That was kind of the way people were looking at all this and the idea that it might have been a bit of a folly to go pro and sort of, um, looking back, it's a bit of kind of, like her and Eddie Hearn have kind of built it and people have come type of thing. And like we heard that other clip, the frustration of kind of the gap between the lower level opponents and then kind of you're going into a shark tank at the other end and now she's kind of swimming with the sharks, but we can look back at this kind of period. But um, I thought that was really interesting because obviously you hear kind of that she's a very religious person and that she's kind of like that her Christianity is very important to her. But I think in terms of what the documentary is setting out to do in terms of kind of witnessing what's happening, those scenes backstage, I think are just kind of, it's kind of amazing to see. It's one of those kind of standout moments from the film and kind of there's tears uh, streaming down her face while her family kind of have their arms on her and, and are going through the prayer. And it's kind of, it's something as well as thinking about like that whole, like I wouldn't be a particularly religious person. I come from kind of a fairly bread and butter kind of Catholic background, but that's, that whole kind of, um, sort of almost mills in Christianity and this idea of kind of God's angels are with you and you're almost kind of like a warrior of God. Um, it's probably not some, it's, it's probably something we hear a lot about kind of in combat sports and you hear of a lot of fighters with kind of very deep faith. This is almost something that maybe we're more used to hearing from kind of American fighters. And it's interesting as well as even kind of like the psychology of sort of having that faith behind her and kind of leaning on it. I think it adds a lot to her story and lots of kind of understanding her personality and kind of her being a bit of a different sports person. So I think kind of all this stuff, like half the documentary is kind of the amateur career. Um, and then the second half is kind of this pro stuff where it's kind of the fly in the wall stuff. And for me, I think the first half will be great in the future as I kind of, because it has brilliant archive footage and brilliant input, but it's this second half I think is just so interesting. And um, we're just getting these little nuggets and just picking up these little things. Um, 
But uh, yeah, like even I heard Eddie Hearn the other day speaking about her walkout, which is kind of, it's almost kind of after the facts, looking back and thinking about that walkout. Like, I don't know what you guys thought when she was coming out, that kind of slow, methodical, almost kind of like, uh, almost this kind of trudge to the ring. Like, were you guys thinking she's soaking it in, she's feeling the pressure, or what, what, what was going through your mind at that stage? There's a possibility that she's <clears throat> terrified, and there's a possibility that she knows that she's going to uh, destroy her opponent. And there was probably no middle ground in what I was thinking at that point. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, it was Deontay Wilder who came out in the thing that was three stone that yeah. left him absolutely exhausted. That ruined his entire boxing career. Exactly. I, I, uh, that aside, I try not to read too much into the walkout because otherwise it's just a means of getting you from the dressing room to the ring. And um, I don't know, you, you're imbuing it with some sense of meditative quality, something where you know John was talking about he him having a religious experience watching the football last night where do you think this is part of the religious experience it's like it's either part of religious experience or it's like trying to ice your opponent it's sort of I don't know I saw it's really interesting because we've never really seen it even I like, saw Eddie Aaron speaking afterwards I kind of he was watching it going what the hell is this kind of we've never seen this we've never seen even kind of like this it's sort of like a grandiose gesture in its own way that kind of almost kind of like the undertaker like slow 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 walk staring you down um eddie herman was also saying as well he kind of got a message in the morning of her walkout song which is um it's called awake my soul it's by this kind of christian music collective and it's this kind of like fate power ballad and kind of eddie said he was like listen to it having breakfast and like in his head he was going jesus we should not throw on a bit of you too or something but he was like i'd never say it to her but kind of that was going through his mind but um I thought it was interesting. I thought kind of it was just watching those kind of prayer scenes and watching that, it kind of just clicked together as sort of maybe understanding a little bit better her mindset going into these things. But um, just kind of an example of what I think is a great job that the documentary does, particularly that second half on the pro career of just sort of um, like documenting this yeah, like, yeah. incredible thing that's going on. It, look, it, it, it obviously is an incredible thing that's going on, but... Um, in the aftermath of the Masters, thinking that it was a bit ridiculous to be, you know, praising Jesus for making the ball to go into the uh, hole. Is it not a bit ridiculous too to be like, make my punches accurate? I don't understand. Probably, I don't. I don't understand the Christianity behind that. It probably is, and also you see her saying like, the most important part of her preparation is that pre-fight prayer. So like, I might. I mightn't understand it or it mightn't do anything for me or for you same way we were speaking about the master a few weeks ago but obviously it clicks for her whether it's sort of is the most important part though is, I, I do like the most important part is the sit-ups and the push-ups and the miles running and the hundreds and hundreds of rounds of sparring and the the strength and conditioning and the tactical and technical stuff hmm. like that that is the most important stuff yeah, yeah, no, like it, it obviously is, and I, I do think there's like a slight difference between Scheffler and Katie with how they talk about a Scheffler. Maybe Scheffler's just like ridiculously horizontal and just like yeah, you know what I mean, God just pulls the ball into the hole. Uh, whereas with with Katie, it's like a very sort of active thing. Yeah, no, and I I did feel like uh, so when she was an amateur, certainly we would have heard this the whole way yeah, through. Yeah, it's London. less now, right? It completely disappeared. Yeah until the documentary and then it has started to re-emerge I think recently enough so I was thinking a, that, that, I was... that the, the publicity afforded the faith is is certainly a conversation because we, we we never spoke about it we, we spoke about it in London yeah a good bit and she spoke about it a good bit every in single interview yeah um, and then it kind of disappeared and it was it was uh, backgrounded significantly and I, I, like I, I find all that stuff a massive turn off I definitely find it for any sports people talking about their faith. It's like I, I'm just I find it difficult to because it seems very selfish generally, and I'm not talking about Katie in, in specifically in this, but for the golfers in particular, it's like I am being rewarded for my faith. I'm being given millions and millions and millions uh, versus the other people in the field. I am being chosen here, which is, yeah. seems nonsensical. But that's not the whole point of religion. It certainly is not the point of. of the, the original message of Christianity, which is love thy neighbor. I know, but what, what about the psychology? Love thy neighbor would take all the money from the golfers. Yeah, no, I get that. But what about the like the psychological element of all of this? Isn't it like that's that's makes as little sense as as 
as many other things in, in sport, the idea of how psychology actually works and what actually motivates you, what actually is, is keeping you on uh, an even keel when you know that you are a few strokes clear and about to wear that green jacket or you know that the you're fragility about to get the, of the head human mind. off you by one yeah. of the greatest female uh, uh, boxers of all time. And I, I find that psychological element of it so fascinating and I find the arc of the importance of uh, the the religion in Katie even more interesting because that for me suggests that there's been a different uh a different thought process when it comes to the importance of religion in her preparation for sport not just in her life but in her preparation for sport this is a, a, a centerpiece of it just on that quickly um one i think like yeah this is kind of it's an interesting chat to have i think that's why it's so interesting to have this footage kind of fully understand that mindset and i completely appreciate everything you're saying jerry but also that's kind of part of why i wanted to highlight that clip is because I think it's interesting and even just kind of looking at it a bit more coldly just understanding that psychological state of mind and kind of the impact it can have then just on the sort of broader thing like yeah it i was did a quick kind of google just when i was doing a bit of a dive into this yesterday and like she's not it does like she's not she's very vocal on sort of the whole uh, about her fate and there, there were kind of some older comments or stuff like oh you can you can uh, we're open to everything apart from god these days that type of stuff but um more recently, she doesn't seem to be very outspoken on social issues, so I don't know if it is kind of a case that her fate is more kind of, she wants to keep it more of a, like, private in a way thing, as opposed to I'm telling people what I believe, I'm not trying to push it on other people. It's interesting you're saying she's speaking about it less, but there was, and um, we probably don't have time to play it, but there was a more recent clip from The Zone in kind of the build-up to one of her recent fights on YouTube where she's talking again, kind of, it's like, talking very um, vividly about kind of the specific pieces of scripture about kind of being a kind of soldier of God and him sort of guiding you type of stuff. Uh, that's not a direct quote and I don't want to do the quote. Uh, like, Mr. Joseph, yeah. That's kind of like the underlying message. Is that more kind of militant, kind of like the angry uh, or like more... Evangelical. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like her Twitter profile has, uh, her bi- her bio rather, has uh, pieces uh, of the Bible reference in it, for example. So, yeah, that's that's definitely a, a big part of, of who she is and, and what she what she believes is believes in. Maybe it's her Instagram um, bio, because her Twitter bio says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. Um, Liam McKiernan, or Liam McCourt, right, sorry, Liam McCourt, when we talked to her, was similar. I, I do think the uh, link between... Uh, faith and combat sports is interesting and we should come back to that at some point as well. Okay, so that's the um, second episode of this, Joseph. Well done. You're recommending everybody goes and digs that out, basically. Yeah, exactly. And it's um, it's up it's up a few places. It kind of, it's as far as I can see, it's not available kind of uh, free anywhere, but it's one ninety nine to watch it on uh, Amazon Prime. So that's probably the handiest place to get it. But um, yeah, I really recommend, especially this week, especially the second half of it, just kind of going back and sort of re-watching it, knowing what we know now, post Pursuit Voice, yeah. post uh, Mass Square Garden, with okay. kind of even the Grove Park question hanging over everything, kind of, um, yeah, definitely, it was very interesting. And also, if you are, if you have seen it um, and don't feel like watching it again, I definitely recommend digging out that interview with Alan from a couple of years back with Ross Whittaker. That was very... There's a lot of very interesting stuff in that as well. All right. but, um, yeah, that's. Have you seen Katie by uh, Ross Whitaker and uh, Joseph Conroy this week? Tw- uh, Twenty minutes past nine.